a lot of mainstream and even some heterodox um, scholarship on development, uh, development is reduced to a kind of technical problem that we need to fix. Whereas dependency theorists always saw that there was a problem of power inequality, um, that you needed to understand power dynamics in order to understand both inequalities within the periphery, but also, of course, power inequalities within the global economy. My name is Ingrid Harvold Quangraven, and I'm a lecturer at King's College London. So in our new book, um, Decolonizing Economics, an introduction, uh, Carolina Alves, David Kadat, and Serbi Kazar and I are analyzing how the economics field became Eurocentric and remains Eurocentric. And we identify how to challenge this and how you can have a you know, South-centered theory. And dependency theory is um, uh, one way of doing this or one tradition that does um, take the South as a starting point for theorization. So this could be one uh, avenue to challenge your centrism in the field. So what is dependency theory is uh, actually quite a complicated question. Dependency is a situation where an economy is conditioned by the expansion or development of another economy. This opens up for a range of different kinds of uh, theorizations and approaches to dependency, like what does it mean to be conditioned, um, how did the conditioning happen historically? And uh, what are the implications of th this conditioning? How do you get out of it? So that's the kind of starting point of dependency, that there are these um, economies in the periphery, as the dependency theorists called it, that are conditioned by being a part of the global economy with um, center countries as well. So within this, uh, Tonio de Santos this was a Marxist. There were a lot of Marxists writing about this in the 70s. Uh, there were also structuralists as well and institutionalists. So there were actually really big debates and disagreements about what dependency theory uh, is or was. The dependency theory in many ways was a reaction to theories that were put forward in the global north, modernization theory, developmentalist theory, also some uh, varieties of Marxist theory, Eurocentric Marxist theory. So what the dependency theorists um, how they were theorizing was building on this, but rejecting kind of Eurocentrism. So you had anti-colonial, anti-imperialist Marxism. Uh, you had structuralists that took uh, dependency into account. You had institutionalists as well. Um, so those are the main theoretical strands within the tradition. So I think dependency theory has um, a bit of a reputational problem since because of the name of the tradition, dependency theory. And that's what led me to try to identify what is the core of the tradition? What are the strengths of the tradition? Um, so what I then um, identify as the strengths of all of these different uh, theoretical traditions that see dependency in different ways is, first of all, that it has um, it, they all take a global historical approach. And look at the development of capitalism, how it interacts with colonialism, and how this uh, leads to very different, um, stru differently structured economies in the periphery compared to the uh, center countries. And then the second one is that they um, theorize about how capitalism tends to be polarizing or the unevenness of capitalist development. So that's also important because it moves away from just describing what's going on uh, in the periphery to actually theorizing so that we can explain and understand. The third is that they focus on um, structures of production. So it moves away from a lot of the development literature that looks at just culture or education or institutions to really look at like how is production organized, what are the social relations, and how is this uh, a part of the um, global economy. Finally, uh, there is the kind of focus on the particularities of the countries in the periphery uh, and the particular constraints that they face. So this is about um, theorizing from the vantage point of the periphery or the global south. Uh, which was uh, very, very important in the 70s. Um, as I said, the dependency theory is kind of a reaction to what they saw as Eurocentric uh, theorizing in the North. A lot of mainstream social theory tended to see the development of capitalism as something that was peaceful, that was endogenous to Europe, that happened uh, because of scientific advancements, um, the Enlightenment, hard work, and then swept away everything that had to do with colonialism or the uh, slave trade, which led to a very distorted view of um, how capitalism operates. But the problem, of course, for the dependency theorists was not just that this sort of theory existed in terms of under trying to understand Europe. A lot of these social theorists uh, universalized these ideas to expect universal laws to apply to countries across, um, across the world. So in that sense, uh, it's a really important aspect of dependency theory that most of them were based in the Global South and they saw things from the perspective of the Global South. So this is also um, a kind of uh, a tradition that can help us to try to challenge Eurocentrism in economic theory today.
those four features uh, distinguish dependency theory and define dependency theory, but probably within each of the four, um, you see like a, um, a stark difference with the mainstream. So the historical approach is very different from like an equilibrium approach, for example, or what's often common in development economics is to, you know, um, try to identify relationships based on cross-country regressions. So therefore, um, removing the historical specificities, you know, the gold standard in development economics now is to just do experiments to try to see how behavior affects different developmental outcomes. And that also, you know, is starkly different from a kind of global historical approach that tries to understand how development problems are historically specific to um, the periphery or different countries in the periphery. And then the structures of production also is very different from some parts of the mainstream, at least, that tend to focus more on culture, education, institutions. So it leads to very different kinds of questions and a different focus. And then the polarizing tendencies of capitalism is, is of course, very different from this view that there would be convergence, uh, which is still dominant in a lot of um, theorizing today that assumes that eventually countries will and can catch up. But you can see that, you know, there are some clubs of countries that have been able to catch up to a certain extent. Um, and there are some countries that have been able to move from the periphery to the center, but very, very few. There's like South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong and Singapore that have made this leap. So generally we see that there, there are still very um, large unevenness, that the world is still more or less um, divided into, into center and periphery. And then uh, finally, of course, the constraints to um, development that are particular to the periphery are incredibly important in terms of rejecting this idea that um, developing countries are just latecomers, that they're like a pre-image of what the, the advanced countries are today, that they can just use the same policies, that they're like smaller versions of, a, of an industrialized country. Um, so that's also a, a big difference from mainstream theory. A lot of mainstream and even some heterodox um, scholarship on development uh, development is reduced to a kind of technical problem that we need to fix, whereas dependency theorists always saw that there was a problem of power inequality, um, that you needed to understand power dynamics in order to understand both inequalities within the periphery, but also, of course, power inequalities within the global economy. It's quite common in a lot of um, development literature and in history of thought to argue that you know things have changed so drastically since the 70s that dependency theory is no longer relevant. So you have the fragmentation of global value chains, which has led to manufacturing spreading to the, the periphery. You have financialization, you have you know, the rise of China, you have the East Asian tigers that managed to, managed to develop within capitalism. If you think of dependency theory as a research program, it is um, highly relevant. Actually, I think I argue that I, uh, actually dependency theory as a research program can explain exact, exactly these changes in a very fruitful way and draw attention to certain aspects that um, you might not see if you don't take a dependency approach. So, for example, we could start with the uh, global value chains. And it's a common misconception that uh, dependency theorists argued that um, the periphery was poor because they were exporting raw materials and the center was rich because they were uh, exporting manufactured goods. Actually, the, the dependency theorists were looking at what kind of production you know, is going on. What are the potential for spillover effects? What are the potential for technological development? How is this integrated into the wider labor markets and the, the wider uh, economy and, of course, also the global economy? So they were concerned not simply with you know, what is the export, but like what the characteristics are more broadly. So Therefore, when you see a lot of countries in the periphery moving into global value chains, this approach to thinking about the characteristics of production or the structures of production can draw our attention to the fact that um, the, the parts of the global value chain that move to the global south tend to be uh, low value added, uh, very little opportunity for technological upgrading. From a dependency perspective, you can kind of uh, understand that the while you might think that spread of manufacturing to you know the whole world would lead to some kind of rebalancing of the economies, actually what we see is continued polarization. Innovation and technological development remains highly concentrated in the center countries, and it seems you know more and more difficult for countries to upgrade. Paying attention to power and the constraints peripheral countries face can help us understand why global value chains are not this you know amazing road to development. And this is also quite different to the traditional approach to global value chains or the mainstream approach to global value chains, which tends to focus on the firm. Like what can the firm do in order to upgrade? Or what kind of industrial policy would be good for a firm to be able to upgrade? Which again, reduces development to this technical 
uh, aspect and brushes away all the power dynamics and problems that have to do with yeah, the unevenness of capitalism and the high concentration of innovation. So the other thing, um, of course, that has has led people to say that dependency theory is irrelevant is the transition of some countries to to uh, center status, global north status, developed status. But if you think of dependency theory as a research program, uh, I argue that actually you can even understand the development of a country like South Korea better, even though that is something that you know is a transition from periphery to the center. Dependency theorists did not say that you know, it's po impossible to make that transition, that uh, it's impossible to develop within capitalism. What they drew attention to was ex how extremely difficult it is because of the way their economies had historically developed and, you know, the particular constraints. So if you look at South Korea, in contrast to sort of main in main the mainstream, there's often, the miracle is often explained by looking at um, domestic policies or market-based policies. And in the heterodoxy, it's often explained by the developmental state. Um, but a dependency theory approach would actually look at, okay, how did capitalism develop in South Korea and what was the role of colonialism? South Korea was colonized by Japan, uh, which was colonizing Korea on the way to trying to conquer China. And actually Japan integrated the South Korean economy with its own, uh, which led to industrialization actually in South Korea. Korean businessmen were incorporated into the structures of industry uh, at the time during colonialism rather than subordinated um, which is extremely different from how colonialism operated in um, African countries, other Asian countries, and in Latin America, where it was a lot more sort of establishment of just extractivism. So this industrial development laid the foundations for what was later then to become the, the developmental state, where um, South Korea was allowed to implement a lot of trade policies, industrial policies, that were not um, encouraged by other countries in the periphery at the time. And South Korea, of course, this is one of the problems that dependency theorists um, pointed to, is that if you want to industrialize as a peripheral economy, you are basically uh, more or less doomed to run trade deficits, which is a, a really difficult to finance for a country in the periphery. But South Korea got lots of external financing from the US and Japan, and this had to do with its geopolitical location, uh, strategic geopolitical location next to the threat, the communist threat of North Korea. So again, we're back to kind of power dynamics and the particular historical uh, and political um, situation of South Korea uh, led some of these constraints um, that were there for most peripheral countries. Taking this kind of dependency approach to understanding South Korea can actually help us kind of give a richer picture of how it managed to develop and also why it's so incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to replicate that exact model. I think in a world um, today where we see um, uh, you know, incredible inequalities in terms of average incomes, in terms of ability to um, finance development, in terms of differences in monetary uh, autonomy. A dependency theory research program can really help to understand and challenge these inequalities and try to, you know, think of ways to um, to overcome these inequalities. And I think that's it's very fruitful. And actually, it's getting dependency theory is getting a lot more traction recently. There's been a lot more uh, publications within a dependency theory tradition, I think because a lot of uh, scholars and students are seeing that um, these inequalities are so durable and persistent. So in a sense, I think there, that dependency theory has a positive future, um, that it can help us explain things. And also, there's more room now uh, in maybe not in economics, but in other social sciences, to use dependency theory, which for political reasons was um, for a long time undermined, marginalized. There is a problem of uh, Eurocentrism in economic theory, uh, especially after um, the uh, murder of George Floyd in 2020. Uh, the economics field is also going through this reckoning that field can't grapple with racial inequalities, the field can't grapple with imperialism, uh, which is a reckoning that um, a lot of other social science uh, fields had in the 70s and 80s. Now, you know, economics is a latecomer, uh, but that's a good thing, that's an opening, and dependency theory is a tradition that can help to um, open up avenues for understanding uh, inequalities that have to do with colonialism and, and racial inequalities. So that's also another um, uh, reason why dependency theory might uh, gain some more traction in the future.